Right, hello and welcome to GMBN Tech. Today is an Ask show, so if you've used hashtag AskGMBNTech down in the comments of any of our videos, then we can pick up uh, that question and try and answer it for you. So uh, I believe you've got the first question, Isaac. I do, yes. This is from uh, Scabadart. Headset cables seem useless. Another excuse to upcharge? <laughs> I feel it's changed for the sake of it. Ooh, shots fired. Possibly. <laughs> but I, no, I think, I mean, this is coming over from the road, right? And you've seen full integration of like shifting and cables mm. over the last few years on road bikes. That's very much driven by aerodynamics, which is incredibly important when you're racing on the road and not nothing on a mountain bike. And I, there is definitely, it can uh, look, look nicer and neater, which when you start having like, you know, dropper cables, lockout cables, all this stuff, you do, it can be a very cluttered front end. When you tuck it inside, as long as you're not having to work on your bike, it, it does provide that neat look. It can also help you build a slightly stronger frame if you're not drilling ports and all of that routing into sort of the external bits of the, the head tube and that kind of thing. It's, so it's device, there's pros and cons. There, yeah. I think at the moment, I, I don't know actually what I think at the moment. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm torn as well, but I think it's important to say that no one system is the same because um, no. you've got cables that go through steerer tubes and you've got cables that go through headset uh, routing and even the ones that go through headsets can be different. Some are more faffy than yeah. others. Um, so I wouldn't tarnish them all with the same brush, I guess. Uh, is it trying to sell us a new thing? Maybe, Maybe. but it's I up mean, to you to happen. decide whether you want that or not. Not everyone's going for it. Uh, so Paul Mackey 76 says, let's talk about bar ends. Uh, why did they fall out of favor? And is there an argument to bring them back uh, given the enduro trends for hand guards and steeper seat tube angles and forward climbing positions for e-bikes in particular? Um, I mean, you've kind of answered the question mm. for me is that geometry is so forward now that we don't need these kind of bull horns kind of correct yeah. positions. Um, also, uh, there's been some sort of contention with whether they're safe or not. And although they're still UCI legal in enduro and cross country, um, they did ban the sort of middle um, bar ends because uh, they thought they were unsafe. But I reckon a lot of people just wouldn't want to be caught on one of those by mistake. I know people who have ridden very um, tree lined tracks and got them caught in trees. That's the worst. Kind so. Of crash, isn't it? I wouldn't put them in the same category yeah. as hand guards. They might potentially do the opposite. So I think that's why it fell out of favor, would you say? Yeah, we are, recently have seen those tiny little ones on the inside of grips, mm. I think, that you yeah. sort of can hook your fingers into. So it's- Yeah, I've forgotten it, the name, but they actually got, <laughs> they actually really got banned from really? UCI Cross Country oh, now because okay. they're seen as dangerous. Okay. Um, so yeah. And also, if you're thinking about bike packing or trekking and you want those different hand positions, there's so many other options out there like tri bars and, you know, funny shaped handlebars that have like different yeah. hand positions for you. So I think there's better options out there. That's just one of them, isn't it? It's, we've phased it out. Uh, the next question is from Elko or Elkov. It says, oval chain rings, what's the point? I understand they're better for climbing, but why and how do they work? <laughs> oh, it's a, there's a lot of questionable mm. science with oval chain rings. It's a big topic, it's been going for years. Uh, when they originally appeared, Biopace did it in the 90s and actually the reverse of what you see now. It's all to do with accelerating your feet through dead spots. Now, the way it works is when you're sort of supposedly applying the most power to the crank, so in the, the sort of uh, nine and three o'clock positions, you have a, an effectively a harder gear, a bigger bit of the chain ring, and then you're able to push that and it gives you more power. And then when your feet are vertically moving through those dead spots, you have a slightly lighter gear and it just helps you turn the pedals over quicker. Um, that's the theory. That's the theory. We see it on the, Chris Froome used to use them when he was winning Tours de France. Um, but it's no, by no means that common. Uh, same, I see it a little bit in cross country, a little bit in enduro. Some people get away with running them on their single speed jump bikes, which I don't understand how it works. But um, <laughs> it, it's supposed to smooth your pedaling out, uh, but you have to learn to pedal like that and then learn to pedal a round chain ring when you go back. So it's questionable how much of an advantage they actually give you apart from in your head. Yeah, but placebo is scientifically proven to work. So exactly, if it works, if it works, for, works you, for you, it works fine. for you. <laughs> uh, 
Dr. Crimp says, why isn't the industry inverting the uh, actual forks? Um, they're avoiding upside down forks. These aren't in any way more effective than what is used now. I just don't get it. Uh, so I think decoding that question is <laughs> why, why, are we, why are we avoiding, no, why are we starting to go towards upside down when existing ones work so well? Um, there are some positives. Obviously, an upside down fork can be stiffer uh, because you get to put more material around the fork that is wrapping around the wheel effectively. Uh, this is why motorcycles tend to use this form. Um, but conversely, you can get a lot of flex because there's no longer a bridge above that tire or the wheel to stop the forks moving independently. Um, and I think we concern ourselves with weight a lot more than like a motorcycle who can mm -hmm. just pack in a lot more um, rigidity and use more materials to get that rigidity whereas we can't um, so that kind of we hear about torsional flex a lot and that is why a lot of people don't tend to like them um, I also think having stanchions lower down puts people off as well because you're then having the most vulnerable part or the most important part of your your forks down where all the rocks are and where you're riding through rough stuff and potentially scratching them. Um, but on the flip side, it is good to have your forks upside down and have all of the oil in your lowers effectively now up above and coming down and sitting around the seals and around the bushings and keeping your forks very l lubricated so they can feel a lot plusher so why are we seeing them i think people are just going to experiment and i think that's a good thing um, but there's obviously pros and cons for each design i think one of the big things as well is unsprung weight as well, right, and trying to move that into the sprung chassis rather than having lowers not on the right side of the suspension yeah. is the one reason people consider it. Cool. But they haven't really caught on, have they? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the next one is from, it doesn't say who it's from, it's from hashtag AskGMBN Tech. <laughs> well, why didn't 10 mil stems, like Mondraker did a few years ago, catch on, especially for short riders, a 10 mil stem would be nice so they can ride longer reach frames. I'm sure. I don't think I'd want a 10 no, mil stem. I, I've never <laughs> ridden one, but it doesn't appeal, to, to be honest. I guess it makes it shorter and snappier, but it, it, there's, a, there's a limit to that, right? You don't want it too snappy and unpredictable. Mm. Um, we do want a bit of stability on a bike. And also, the, I think the what, reason Mondraker did it when they were initially pushing a really long frame and we don't have to correct sort of bad geometry anymore. No. You know, sizing is now, reach is getting better and better in terms of that long front center. Still have some existing, but they sit right on top of the steer tube and that does, it sort of adds commitment to cutting your steerer and it adds stack height. So it just makes the whole system a bit more inflexible. Mm. Uh, I think we've seen kind of the shortest is around 30 mil now is a good compromise. Still functions like a regular stem uh, and brings it as tight in as possible. Yeah, good point. Uh, so we've got Elko V who says, why is on a hardtail like the Canyon Stoic on the Nuke Proof Scout, all the cable route in except the rear brake um, tends to be on the outside. Um, actually the Scout, only the dropper is internally rooted. And I think it's because you've said cheaper, but let's talk aluminium. Uh, if you have internally rooted cables in an aluminium frame, unless you're spending a lot of money on shrouding and internal uh, cable routing channels effectively, mm. it's gonna slap around, it's gonna make a lot of noise. And as you said, a cheaper bike or a more affordable bike is not gonna be putting that money into making those channels or adding those shrouds. So actually, external routing cables is quite silent. And you know what? It's nice to work on, so why not? External, <laughs> please. Next up is from Zachary Neald. What are the pros and cons of a mullet setup? I've been waiting for the Atherton's AM170 to come out, and it, it is mullet with a 29 front, 27.5 rear. Uh, pros, I think, it's clearance, it's being able to whip the bike around tight corners, uh, less inertia if you're doing tricks, it's lighter wheel maybe a slightly lower bottom bracket, uh, can just more flexibility for seat height, all that kind of stuff. It's just being able to have that agility. Uh, the cons, what size inner tube would you take with you? I mean, two different <laughs> wheel sizes. It means you have to have two different sizes of tires. 27.5 uh, is maybe becoming a little bit more limited in terms of yeah. availability and stock and that kind of stuff. Uh, there is a bit of a 
trade off with rolling over stuff. I suppose that's the whole point of having 29 in the first place is that bunk clearance. Um, and then that top end momentum as well it is going to accelerate faster. Um, but you just lose that advantage of the fast rolling chassis. Yeah, because you effectively change the gear ratio, don't you? Of course, you yeah, of course. Because bigger, bigger wheel means lower gears for a specific gear ratio. So, um, and everything's a little bit closer to the ground, like your rear mech. Yeah, true. So, yeah, it's, there's, pros there's pros and, and cons, cons. isn't it? Downhill, a lot of people are running mullet these days um, because they don't have to pedal up and over stuff, I yeah. guess. I love it, but I wouldn't run it for XE. That's no, silly. I would not. Would I. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Squeevil 608Z, very catchy here, says, uh, why are grip shift dropper posts not a thing? They kind of are. Yeah, I've seen a yeah, lot of yeah. people use grip shift for dropper levers. Um, we've seen a couple on the World Cup. Uh, back in 2022, I believe RockShox were even prototyping a new type of grip shift. Uh, with their World Cup riders to okay. use for their droppers. So um, it does exist. Um, we've seen a lot of mods. Even our own Rich Payne has been modding SRAM blipper buttons in order to work with his axis post. Um, and there's also some Zerbal kind of like collars that work with those as well. So I think go out and try it. Or maybe we should do like we try your hacks. Maybe mm. I should do yeah, I'm, a I'm uh, grip shift. Oh, we'll yeah. do it on your bike then. Oh, yeah. We'll see if we can put a grip shifter on a dropper. Um, but that's all we have time for today. So thanks for stopping by. And if you want to ask us a question, then use hashtag AskGMBNTech down in the comments below right now. And we'll try and get back to you. Yeah, cheers guys. Thanks, bye.